We're ready to start back. Uh, at this time, I want to introduce our last speaker. Uh, he'll be speaking on Muscogee continuity and resilience. This is Dr. Thomas Foster, archaeology professor from the University of Tulsa. Thank you. Do I have this on? Yeah. Good enough? All right. Well, um, uh, so I'm the last one here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we've, various one of us, uh, various um, speakers have mentioned this before, but I want to reiterate that this is something that you know, I think all of us have been wanting to do for a really long time. Uh, I've been thinking about this sort of thing, meaning speaking with you all and trying to share some of the things that we've been learning and and expressing some of the frustration, at least I felt, have felt over my career, knowing that, um, you know, I, I've essentially devoted my career to studying your, your past, and knowing that my, my way of looking at the past is, is biased in many ways. Uh, I can only see certain things just because of the methods that, I've, that I use. Um, and I know that there's a significant... Um, Supplement, and so you know this is really important to us and to me particularly. Uh, so we're honored to be here, and, and I just want to express that before I started talking. Um, as I started studying the history of the Muscogee people over the last uh, ten years or so, mostly, uh, I started noticing uh, a lot of things that looked like a lot of continuity. So we've we've heard a lot about changes over this period, this Mississippian period that we've, we're trying to focus on here. We're sort of trying to focus on a particular time period for this particular symposium. And during this time period, there were a lot of changes. Um, but one of the things that I've been noticing, at least in my research over the last decade or so, is are some continuities. And particularly because archaeologists um, historically have not looked to the descendant populations as much as they have the older, I mean, the, the ancestral populations in terms of learning about the past. Um, I got really interested in this subject. And, um, uh, and so what I want to focus on today is really trying to show some of those things that look like continuities, at least in my own perspective. And the way that I'm going to do that is by sh looking at, again, the only tools that I have, the material, the remains, and documents and observations, I've begun to speak to um, descendants, and I've learned a lot you know, in doing that. But I'm, I'm in my beginning stages of doing that in terms of speak, learning on my own. Um, so what I want to do today is to talk about some things that, that I've identified as continuities, or at least my own perceptions, and sort of go back in time and say, here's something, and here's earlier evidence of it, and here's earlier evidence of it, and here's earlier evidence of it. And so that's what I want to talk, focus on here, some today. And um, some of these might not even be correct. But, you know, it's some of the, it's sort of the, the conclusions that I've been able to draw so far. And I want to focus on a few subjects here. We've heard about some of these already, um, well, over the last day or two, but not everyone's been here the whole time. Uh, community organization, town layout, some architectural things. Some of them have changed, and some of them have resisted change, uh, the ball game ceremonies and aspects of ceremonies that have lasted a long period of time, uh, medicines, uh, some aspects of diet, and some d domestic crafts. These are just a few. Uh, there, there are more, but, we're, but we're, again, we're trying to limit it, this particular symposium. This is a, um, an aerial photograph of a site we've heard about over the last day or two, Etowah, and it shows uh, a few things that um, it shows a ceremonial center uh, here, um, a plaza, public, public area, and uh, some other uh, mounds down here, and then um, a large area that, due to uh, Dr. Co King and some colleagues, are documenting that there's probably a lot of uh, buildings out there. There's evidence of buildings out there underneath the ground. Um, some of this has been excavated. And we've begun to map some of these. There's some structures over here and down here and up here. And there's some over here. But they've been 
documenting by looking underneath the ground without digging, and they, and they found some evidence. Uh, these are some of these structures that I've talked about here, some sort of large rectangular buildings here. But the point of this is that we've got basically a, a public area, ceremonial areas, and then probably residential or camps, camps of some sort of structures that are used by households. And uh, that pattern is an old one. And we've seen that in so, uh, some other talks today. This is uh, another site that was excavated uh, completely. And I want to sort of explain what, what you're looking at here. This is a bunch of black dots, obviously. Uh, these little black dots represent actual holes where posts for a house were. The, the wood itself has deteriorated a long time ago, but the hole where the post is preserved, and it gets filled in with, with um, uh, trash and looser dirt, and so it's very obvious. And so we can see this pattern when we, go to, when we excavate it um, here. And so this is one of these, these sort of large, um, perhaps winter houses or larger uh, warmer houses that we had heard about here. And uh, this actually doesn't belong here, but it's a good illustration of it. So that's what these things are. And so this, this particular community, dating to about 1500 AD, shows that similar pattern that we just saw at Etowah. It has a, uh, a residential area uh, with houses or camps or some sort, some sort of household area. It has a large plaza, public area, uh, some public buildings, and in this public area, not, there are, notice there aren't many little black dots. There's not little, there aren't houses out there. There's not a lot of posts and building materials because that's the public area and it's kept clean. Um, this is a reconstruction of that last site that I just showed you. It just shows you, you know, sort of an art, artist reconstruction. It shows you this public area that's kept clean. And this is where public events happen. And then you've got your residential areas around it. Um, one aspect at this particular town that we saw at Fusachi and also at this one, uh, which earlier, are these rectangular buildings uh, here. They're actually represented here and here and they're all throughout. And then we've got these larger buildings too. Those rectangular buildings, as you might know, have, uh, uh, have lasted a long time uh, due to a variety of reasons. The larger buildings are not being used uh, anymore during this time period here. This is uh, later on. Notice this is about 250 years later. And we have a, a European male that comes through, and he's describing the town and drew some drawings. This is William Bartram. He was a botanist that came through in the 1770s. And he gave us this sort of schematic of what a town looks like. And it's got that similar, same, same sort of pattern 250 years later. It has uh, residential areas. These little rectangles are supposed to are little rectangular buildings like arbors, you know, set around a little courtyard. Courtyard, and these are domestic areas for uh, families. And then we have public areas, and then we have uh, c ceremonial or public uh, meeting places. So it's a similar pattern. Um, uh, this is a, a Bartram again went and visited a single person, per someone who had decided to move off from the main town and live uh, away from, a little, little ways away from town. And this was his, his household. And notice, uh, this is actually another perspective of it right here. This is William Bartram again. Same, and it shows you this sort of architecture that I'm talking about, these sort of rectangular buildings. Uh, this is, uh, Bartram called this the uh, Apalachicola Mikos house. And so this was his house, and he had, and he had these four square arbor buildings around, uh, uh, around this public area right here. So it shows you some, some continuity in the architecture and use of space, public space and private space. All right, um, next, stickball. Stickball, or some sort of ball game, has been around for a long, long time. It's an ancient institution, cultural institution. This is partly what I'm showing about here. This happens to be a, an illustration by George Catlin in the early 1800s of a stickball. Uh, at, and you know, we just saw this out here at the, at the festival. Um, and here's some sticks. Uh, this happens to be a Ch Choctaw example. The stickball, or some sort of ball game, I'm going to go back in time now a little bit further. Again, this is a, um, a William Bartram.
I can talk loud. Oh, no, here we go. All right, I won't move around so much. Uh, it, uh, it, so this is William Bartram. Again, we're stepping back in time a little bit from the, the Catlin example. And we can see this public area, and we've got this big ball pole there. Uh, that same illustration I just showed you a second ago also shows this, this ball field uh, and another example by Bartram, and here's the, our ball poles. This is an, an earlier example. This is a ball post. So the, the I'm sorry, the po ball post hole uh, uh, hundreds of years earlier than that. So the post itself isn't preserved anymore, but again, the hole. This happens, this is a uh, hole at Etowa. This happens to be extremely large post uh, at Etowa, again, it's a, a much earlier than that Bartram example in the Choctaw uh, illustration that I just showed you. This is a drawing of it, and here's a photograph of that large post hole. Um, I'll just step back to the King site for a second, and we've got, again, we've got this artist representation of a post here, and that post here, that big, see that big black dot there in the middle? That's the, that's this post hole for that ball game right there in the middle of the public square again. It's the same sort of pattern. So this, this idea of this public ball game is, is persistent. Now, at the King site, here's that ball post. This is sort of a, this is a, a close up of this right here. And so we're just looking at this ball post. So it has that sort of double post because it was such a big post, it took sort of sliding it in and pushing it up. It was such a large post that they were standing up there. Uh, this is the Bonar map of, 1757, and it shows some interesting things. This is the map of the upper and lower creeks, but on the, on the side there are illustrations. There's a council house. It's one of those large uh, uh, houses. Here's a square ground, and then here's a ball post right here on the bottom corner, 1750s. So here we have various different sources of information, archaeological observation and descriptions and some maps and some illustrations all sort of showing consistency. There's something called the Ball Game Manuscript. This was a, a manuscript that was written in the 1600s. So uh, we're taking our historical documentation back a little bit here. In 1676, and this is a very long manuscript. You can go look this up yourself. And it's, it's basically uh, the Spanish were describing this ball game. And, so, and it goes into a lot of detail. And I wasn't going to put it all in here because we can't do that. But I'll just put in a little quote. Uh, and a leading man throws the ball in the midst of all them who are erect and with their hands raised, it falls into the hand of someone and they fall upon one another at full tilt. And the last to arrive climb up over their bodies using them as stairs. And this is in, quoted in Florida. So this is a ball game, 1600s, uh, being observed. And so we have some historical documentation of it. Um, 1777, ball, the ball play is esteemed the most noble and manly exercise. The game is exhibited in an extensive level plane here they perform amazing feats of strength. More consistency of this, you know. It's like you, you could, we can picture this going on, uh, the, the consistency of it. Um, I'm going to jump into another um, ceremony. The green corn ceremony also seems to have a great antiquity to it. I put this up here. I was going to try to uh, click on it and bring this up to you. You can go to see this manuscript I'm talking about here, too. It's available. But there's apparently not internet here, so I can't do that. But it's OK. Um, just look up OK State, and you can look up this green cord ceremony. Uh, I like this quote because it's interesting, because it's the last known documented green corn ceremony in Alabama uh, right before uh, coming out here. Uh, so this is in 1835 at Tokabachi. This individual observed the green corn ceremony. And again, it's a long document. It goes into a lot of detail from his perspective of what's going on. And uh, that's obviously a biased perspective. But um, it shows some continuity in this particular ceremony, starting here at 1835. This is, a small, uh, this is a small piece of that long document. When the green corn is ripe, the creeks seem to begin their year until after the religious rites of this festival with which their new year is ushered in, it's considered as an infamy to taste the corn. On the approach of the season, there's a meeting of the chiefs of all the town forming any particular clan. First, an order is given out for the manufacture of certain articles of pottery to be employed in the ceremonies. A second meeting gives out a second order. New matting is to be prepared for the seats of the assembly. It goes on and on and on. 
Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea. Uh, and so this is a description of the green corn ceremony in 1835 in Alabama. 140 years earlier, uh, we have uh, Benjamin Hawkins describing this ceremony. And he says, the annual festival is celebrated in the months of July or August. This happy institution of the Buscata restores man to himself, to his family, and to his nation. Um, so back now we're going back into the 1700s. A little bit earlier, 20 years earlier, the busk or the feast of first fruits is their principal festival. This seems to end the last and to begin the new year. This festival is its most solemn celebration, that botanist again that I talked about earlier, William Bartram. So we have historical descriptions of it. Uh, it's, as an archaeologist, it's difficult to, to find evidence of certain behaviors like this. And so this is why we turn to documents when we can. Um, I've been looking at, I went back into the documents to identify roles that people fulfill in these ceremonies to see if I could see evidence of this sort of ceremonial structure in the documents and how far back we can. And this table begins to show you some, some of the consistency in the ceremonial roles and how far back they go, at least documentary. I'm sure they go back further than that. But and so here we have, um, in these ceremonies, we have Mikos. Uh, they are referred by a variety of names in the documents. Um, as Cacique, Chief, Miko, um, and then these are some descriptions of these people. And going back to the 16th century, they're described as superintending of all public and domestic concerns, the supreme civil magistrate. There's actually a lot of data here. I didn't put it all in because it didn't fit. Then we have principal Mikos. Uh, they, they were quoted in, in 1700s, they were quoted as rendering vassalage over a province. Uh, they're assigned duties like log cutting, um, uh, Heneha sometimes called Miko Botka, uh, vice chief, Ineha, described as uh, second Mikos. These particular titles are observed in documents uh, from the 16th century up till the present. So these, the roles of these individuals in ceremonies has, has transcended a long time period. Helis Haya um, is sometimes called a co-chief, uh, making medicine. Tastanagis is observed from the 16th century up to the present as police or enforcers during ceremonies. Tessica Kayagi uh, warriors uh, from the 18th century to the 20th century. And then uh, Dakbalas, a whole series of speakers, or a number of speakers that are observed uh, for a long period of time. These, institution, these ceremonial institutions have been going on for a long period, period of time. Um, and so I'm, and women and beloved women and beloved men, and these are, these are been described in the documents, and so there's evidence at least documentary evidence, that they've been around for a long time, these institutions, ceremonial structure. Ceremonies are also described. Um, this, this particular example, we've, we've heard of this earlier in earlier talks, but this, this was by Hernando de Soto's group, and it said in this ceremony, the, the Miko came out to receive him, de Soto, born on a litter, on the shoulders of his principal men seated on a cushion, and he was surrounded by many attendants playing flutes and singing. So here we have this particular ceremony in the 1500s. William Bartram, again, talks about very similar ceremonies, but 200 and, uh, 250 years later, they show the Miko due respect and the most profound homage especially when assembled in the great rotunda or winter council house. To him, only they bow very low, almost to his feet, when the waiters hand him the shell of the black drink. This black drink, that's another cultural institution that seems to have great antiquity. Again, our ability to measure that, how do you measure the presence of a liquid? It's, it's kind of hard, but we can, as an archaeologist, we can go to some of the artifacts. We can find indirect evidence. We can find direct evidence. We go to the documents when we can. Um, here's some documentary descriptions of this black drink as a part of the ceremony. Um, uh, this is James Adair in the 1770s. says, there's a species of tea 
They grow spontaneously and in great plenty. They drink it on certain stated occasions and in their most religious solemnities in conch shells, so showing some consistency with that other quote. This particular medicine is documented in the historical record uh, as early as in the 1600s, at least a couple of times uh, in, in Florida. Uh, although recently, just last year, there's some archaeologists that looked at the inside of vessels and looked at the residue that's inside that re those vessels from Cahokia. Those particular vessels are from 1100 AD, and that residue, um, I'm talking about here, um, shows residue of this tea. So here we have some indirect evidence uh, on these cups at Cahokia from 1180, so a 1, thousand years ago, there seems to be evidence of this particular medicine still being used. And this is a Cahokia. This is um, way uh, inland and away from where the ingredients for this tea are, are not naturally grown, which is uh, the coast. Those conch shells that they're drinking the black tea in, that may be some indirect evidence of the use of this tea. We find these conch shells all through the southeast sometimes decorated like this. So if these conch shells are part of that ceremony and drinking this black drink, then we have archaeological evidence of this particular ceremony all over the southeast going back in time hundreds of years. These particular examples are from Oklahoma. And these are from Etowah, uh, a site that we're hearing about. Uh, so these may be... May, may show evidence of this particular ceremony, again, hundreds and hundreds of years old. What is this, this, this black drink? And this evidence, this, this is a medicine that was taken during certain ceremonies. This is uh, Hawkins describing it. He says the chemists, uh, again, he, he doesn't really understand the role of the person, what's happening, but so he calls it the chemists. The chemists, uh, uh, they blow into it through a small reed and then it is drank by the men and rubbed over their joints at the green corn ceremony. Here's a quote from the late 1700s. Uh, we heard a lot about diet. I'm going to talk a little bit about diet here. Diet um, goes through some changes. It's very complex. It goes through some changes. Uh, there's parts of it that are resistant, parts of it that change. It's very, uh, very complex. Um, but there are, during the Mississippian period, uh, we heard about pre-Mississippian period yesterday, and there are lots of changes that go on pre-Mississippian up through the Mississippian. But during the Mississippian period, for these last few hundred years, there's some aspects that are relatively stable. Uh, one, uh, uh, well, let me explain these images here. These images uh, are nice. They're, I like them because they're colorful, and they're direct observations of some plants that the native people in the southeast were using, and they were growing around their houses, and it shows some, some visual evidence of some of the things that we see archaeologically, these squashes, uh, the maypops that are like are out on the, the table out there. Uh, a, excuse me? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, corns and, and nuts. Again, the, the use of hickory. And that's, you know, that's, that's an extremely old uh, food source that was extremely stable, and there's a lot of continuity there. Um, here's a, another quote that shows you some of this in use. This is by Bartram, who, again, he's a botanist, so he's given us sort of a botanical look at these, some of these plants. And he says, their vegetable food consists chiefly of corn, rice. There was a question about rice the other day. Uh, those nourishing roots, usually called sweet potatoes, uh, all the species of squashes, pumpkins, they have in use a wide variety of wild or native vegetable, both roots and fruits, persimmons, red mulberry, acorns, from which they extract a very sweet oil, which enters all their cookery. This is in the 18th century. So we have archaeological evidence that we heard about yesterday. We have historic descriptions that show some continuity in parts of the, the diet. Uh, very, uh, some, one of the ways that archaeologists learn about this is we go to basically trash pits, you know, where uh, storage pits were dug in the ground, and then 
and it gets filled up with old trash, food remains, and plants. And when we dig down through this and take out those, the, that, that residue, it's got all these food remains in it. And so here's a very large one here. And uh, this is a table of some very late, I say um, historically late, re, pre, right pre-removal, like late 1700s, right around 1800 villages, and the percentage of plant remains. And it shows uh, a fairly traditional uh, diet for the Mississippian period. These, uh, a lot of maize, see the percentage up here, maize percentage. Uh, other crops, grasses, oily seeds, high percentage of this, um, and uh, fruits, again, a high percentage there, too. So relatively late, up until 1800, we see uh, a fairly consistent traditional botanical part of the diet. The animal part of the diet is more complex, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, part of cooking this cooking these, uh, this food are, the, are domestic, is domestic, the use of domestic pottery. And that's another thing that it, although it changes, styles change, just like cl or clothing styles change fairly rapidly, the manufacturing and the form, the, you know, the, the way it's, the food is cooked uh, has some continuity for hundreds of years, and even up into, into Indian territories. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Bartram again. He says, the women make all their pottery. Here's an example of one, uh, one of these vessels from about 1500 uh, at Etowah. And you can see this is that, we've seen some examples of this, not exactly the same, but this is a coil technique, and this is uh, a bowl, and it's got some decoration across the top. Um, 200 years later at Fusachi, uh, we have the same sort of shape, and again, you know, very similar. There's some slight variations, but so 200 years later, there's, there's some continuity here in the way these women are making these, these vessels. Uh, this is another one. It's a different form, but similar technology. You can see here the, the, the rim here is out flaring as opposed to going in, and the decorations on the inside here. Uh, Casita is another similar time period site. Uh, we found a lot of examples of this domestic pottery there, taking other forms. This is a more of a uh, presentation bowl. It's got different form. It has some red painting on the inside, so that's different. Um, this is probably a soft key pot. We find, we find this form and this, this vessel for hundreds of years. So this is a large vessel, maybe about this big. And if you look on the inside of the vessel, there's sort of kind of uh, it's very rough up till about this high next to the edge. And this is because it's been, uh, it's been cooked in uh, for a long time period, uh, corn and lye, and that lye is eaten away the edge on the inside. So we, we have direct evidence of Safki being cooked in these pots for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's showing you some continuity in the foods and cooking techniques and the technology that's being used. Uh, 200 years later, different site, similar form, similar technology. looks very, very similar. Um, like here, this is this, very similar to this one here. And um, uh, even the decoration, after about 1700, even the, the external decoration becomes very, very similar. It doesn't change. Even, it, it even stays the same here in Oklahoma. Here's an example of it, one of these vessels here in Oklahoma. It's very, very similar and even has the external decoration that's exactly the same as it was 200 years earlier. This was uh, described here in Oklahoma in the 1950s. This is another one. It's a, very, a, a portion of those, those large soft key pots at uh, Casita. So what I've described here are some areas of continuity. This isn't all of it. This do, you know, there certainly have been changes, but there's a lot of continuity here, and I think that uh, I, as a professional, need to uh, listen to and observe the descendants more. And that's what I've been trying to do over the last 10 years or so of my professional career, because there is a lot to be learned here. Um, I, our, I think m many in our discipline have felt for, certainly in the past, that there was a big discontinuity between the past 
and what's here today. And so there hasn't been a lot of attention. And so I'm trying to, trying to demonstrate some of that continuity. Uh, in con at least today, in structure, some architecture, uh, has been continuous for a few hundred years. The ceremonies and, cer and the rules and the institutions around these ceremonies, uh, the medicine and its use. Uh, the medicines have changed a little bit. There is some continuity in some of the medicines, but there's also some discontinuity. Uh, diets uh, have changed in modern times, uh, but not too long ago there was a lot of continuity. And domestic crafts are, are a few of the things that I wanted to share with you today. But no. Questions? For, uh, this is toward the end of the talk, so it could be for any of us. But go ahead. I, I noticed you didn't bring up anything about the Christian side of uh, the creeks down there. Uh, now, they played a big part in the... Uh, movement from down there to up here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They uh, were going to force march them seven days a week. But the uh, Christians got together and said they were going to take Sundays off. They weren't going to march on that day. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, the songs that they sang might take time out to find you some Greek songs. They may tell you, uh, the Christian songs, they may tell you a little bit. I, I don't doubt that. Yeah, I don't know much about that. Uh, another aspect that biased this talk is that I was trying to limit it to a particular time period, and so I didn't incorporate that. But you're, and in addition to that, I'm not as knowledgeable about that. So thank you. To kind of go over your, your remark there, we, we were coming from the Mississippian period right to pre-removal. Yeah. In our next uh, symposium, which we hope to have in March, we're going to cover the, uh, the, right, the period right before removal to us in Oklahoma. So um, if you're here at that time, I'm sure your question, that question will be answered. I mean, that information will be brought forth. Sure. Yes, that's when. That's when. Um, hopefully it's going to be in March. Uh, we may be maybe sooner, uh, depending on how, what kind of um, comments people make about this one. We may try to get it. We, you know, we're we're trying to plan it in March because some of our uh, uh, professors that we're going to use may be able to get here in uh, in March. So you were saying Sofki, I think we say Osofki. Osofki, okay. <laughs> All right. Depends on if you're from the south or from the north. <laughs> <laughs> Sofki. <laughs> In your uh, study about diet and the foods, um, what do you find about the culinary ash that is used by the Creeks in their Chattahaga? And the lie and the softy and do you have any comment? All that. Uh, certainly, the the lie and the hominy has long been made, <clears throat> and we can only assume that the culinary ash is a very long tradition. So um, I know, but what is what is the purpose of that? Oh, the, the culinary ash. ash? Mm -hmm. um, it gives flavor, so it gives a salt-like flavor, and then so, and the. Um, the hominy, I think, helps give a more nutritious corn than you'd get without it. So it releases, corn itself is lacking some amino acids, and I think that helps make it more nutritious. Um, and so, um, and then some other, you know, there's a number of techniques that also help to reduce toxins in plants. So plants are flavorful in part because they have little poisons in them to keep insects from eating them. And so sometimes you process the food to help <clears throat> reduce the toxins for the human 
So if you add a little clay in, that could take toxins out. And fermenting can take toxins out. And ash, for all I know, might do that too. I, I don't know. You know, so a very smart way to make your food more nutritious or more tasty or even healthier. Would the nature of it also uh, rid the body of parasites? Uh, there are certain plants you can take, like uh, wormwood, <laughs> that do that, artemisia. So um, certainly people knew of those plants, and, and probably it could be that some of the processing techniques would, would do that too. People, very smart. <laughs> Uh, I just wondered if uh, it would be possible to post on uh, the preservation website, the Creek Nation website, some kind of a bibliography based on the presentations today, if the, each of the uh, speakers could do that. Some did put, like, mention web links and things like that. Some of us are scribbling just as hard as we can, and some of us can't see the, the print on the screen. Sure. But just the basic bibliography from each one of you, I think, that we could download later would, to me, seem to be really helpful. Just as soon as the uh, consultation, I mean, the, we're used to consultations, it's not consultation. The symposium is over. We're going to get all this information together. Um, like we said, this is actually the cultural preservation's uh, first attempt at something like this. So there's a lot of things that, that we need to do that we didn't do. Uh, so I ask for your forgiveness for the mistakes that we made or if we made any. Uh, but that type of information will be on our uh, website as uh, soon as Gainel gets it on there. Not sure where you went. Oh, he'll have it on there about three, he said. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I have a question. To try to, excuse me, we're, we also mentioned that we're intending to try to take all these talks and put them into a, a, a document to publication. Hi. Uh, I regret that I couldn't attend until uh, this afternoon, on the, in the afternoon on both days, so I apologize in advance if I ask a question that's already been covered in, in, in the presentations or in the Q&A. But I'd like to say that I'm, I'm really, um, really interested in, in your work, Dr. Foster, and really excited to hear about um, the kind of work that you're doing. And um, I guess my, my question is to uh, some of the other uh, presenters here is, I know that, you know, in the 70s there was this, with Charles Hudson, that there was this move to really bridge the gap between the, uh, I guess, the prehistory and historic Muskogee period. And, and, uh, and I imagine that, you know, some of you here, I, I believe, I, Adam King, I missed your talk. I, I apologize. I really wanted to hear that and um, to hear more about uh, uh, I guess the use of history and, and uh, ethnography and archaeology to kind of bridge that gap. So what my question is, is in the academy in the southeast where there's, you know, this very, you know, rich tradition and kind of legacy in the academy itself of, of uh, you know, a focus on the Mississippian era and, you know, ancient uh, Muscogee ancestors. I mean, is there is there a kind of dialogue or discussion or interest in in descendants and and uh, how your research and your work can be useful here in a really kind of applied way? Uh, looking at uh, doctors, Dr. Wagner's presentation, uh, really kind of my my uh, what I knew about. Uh, what we consider traditional Muscogee foods really kind of, you know, turned some of that on its head. And I saw a lot of things there in terms of food processes, 
uh, particularly the squash blossoms and and you know she's talking about you know processing and and you know experimentation with how to prepare these foods so that's really fascinating to me that you're having to kind of of uh, I guess experiment with ways to to uh, I guess recreate those kind of food processes that have that have been lost and uh, so there was the squash blossoms, and you talked about that those were edible. And I remember seeing, I know that there is a, a local woman that does prepare squash blossoms, and I, I, I thought that was an odd kind of thing. I'd never heard of it. But I think that's really telling in terms of what we can learn from uh, descendants and tribal people today. And uh, so it was really useful for me to, to be able to to, uh, I guess, get that little bit from uh, Dr. Wagner's presentation and kind of link it up to, to uh, you know, a woman who's still, you know, preparing these squash blossoms. So that was my comment, and my question was uh, to the panelists if, if there's that kind of discussion and dialogue in the, you know, academies of anthropology and archaeology uh, about descendants and, and how your work has a bearing on, on us today and even coming up with, uh, I guess, solutions to addressing, you know, so, some social issues and diet-related disease. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there's a growing dialogue and interest and certainly among the group, among the group who's here. So we, we seek out. Um, Indians to be our graduate students because they should be the ones who are telling these stories and and we're we're better at recognizing our own biases so I was raised in the society who saw humans as separate from nature and I'm trying to interpret a culture who probably had a very different worldview so I'm pushing my graduate students my non Indian graduate students to say wait a minute your worldview doesn't give you the, the framework that's proper. See if you can stretch yourself and try to think of how you would frame things differently with a different worldview. And I have a graduate student who's trying that. I'm very impressed that he's really trying. But um, so I think there's a growing effort and interest in our part, but we, we need Creek archaeologists. Let's face it. I mean, you have questions we'd never think of asking or ways of looking at things that we just are, are foreign to us, and so we, we, we really welcome that and like to see more. This summer, uh, who, I couldn't see who was speaking. Who? Okay. Uh, this, this summer, uh, with Dr. King, uh, we had students excavating at Etowah, but we were not alone. We had two groups from Creek Nation come and excavate with us. And, uh, and the plan is for in all future uh, excavation attempts, first of all, we get permission from any of the tribal peoples involved. And secondly, we want to have Muscogee people there with us, uh, uh, supplying things like questions we need to answer, and also learning the techniques that we've learned so that it can go back to you, so you can conduct your own excavations. It's your past, you know, and you ought to have the tools that are necessary in order to recover that past. Um, also, I mean, you saw me here as a paleoethnobotanist, but I'm also the archaeologist who works on Kofa de Chequi, which is the easternmost chiefdom. And I, too, when down the road here, we expect some um, Duke Power Company money. <laughs> and a at that time, I, I would like to not proceed without the approval and help of the Creek Nation. Uh, because that money will be to be looking at a mound, and a mound is a sacred place. 
and um, I don't want to touch it if I shouldn't. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was late coming in myself uh, today, but I'd like to. I was interested in the, um, the food and the cooking and the herbs and plants. And um, did anybody uh, make any comments on the origin of fry bread? I just wanted, I had a question for Dr. Riley just to follow up what he said. You're asking for students um, on, on for like this coming up summer because so I'm basically asking for my daughter because <laughs> she's a student also. Um, are there any maybe, uh, and I might need to go through preservation department, I don't know. Are, do you guys have things set up uh, where you might take on college students where they can actually take part in this? I mean, she's she's a pre-med major, so she's getting science, but she's not archaeology, but... Okay. All right. <laughs> I think that as a full blood, uh, we were taught that we're very superstitious and that to be um, digging into graves and such is, you know, desecration. That's kind of uh, another component of this symposium that we were having. One of the, one of the uh, things that we wanted to address, first of all, uh, was about our history. Uh, second was a lot of our Indian people think that these gentlemen and ladies um, are bone diggers. And I think uh, as we went through this uh, informational symposium, you saw that their work is giving us a lot of information about us. Uh, they're not out intentionally um, digging up places. I mean, a lot of a lot of these places that a lot of our homes, of our, I mean, our sites that are in our hometowns are in uh, in danger of being um, developed. So, um, you know, the developers call upon these people to come out and you know to get what they can. Like they said, sometimes they have to do salvage archaeology. So, you know, we were hoping to kind of get that. Um, to get that across to folks here that, uh, you know, that they're not bone diggers, you know, they're out, uh, they're actually helping us find out about ourselves. And to address the young lady's comment here, that's another thing about our folks, uh, and we've talked to archaeologists about that, you know, it's kind of hard for us to ask our children or ask our, our relatives to get in this type of work because of the very thing that she said, you know, digging up uh, ancestors or, or uh, you know, having anything to do with graves is against our, um, the way that we were taught. But in some cases, you know, it's going to be left up to us to do that, to put these people back. Um, you know, they've been, they've been disinterred, so it's up to us to go back and make sure that they're put back to their, to their, back to their resting places. So that was kind of another uh, component of, the, of this. And I'm hope I'm hoping that we've kind of got a little interest in everybody to kind of, like I said, spark that interest, like Yvette was saying, you know, she you know, like for her daughter to get into something like that. And I'm hoping that each of us can take home, uh, maybe talk to somebody and say, you know, those guys are, you know, there's a lot of history, our history to be learned back there, and we need to do more of this. So um, let me get off my soapbox for a minute. Go ahead. In addition to that, I'd just like to add, uh, there are laws, federal laws, such as the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act that pretty much help us protect these uh, human remains and, and uh, funerary objects and sacred objects, things like that today. A uh, lot, lot of the uh, remains that are in repositories and things like that, majority of them have been uh, probably gathered back in the 30s and things during the WPA era and, and those types of things. So like it or not, it's incumbent on us to work with NAGPRA and to repatriate these remains, get them reburied. Yeah, and I like to say that, that 
the vast amount of information that we've been talking about here, the conclusions, findings that we've, you've heard about over the last couple of days is not from digging burials. It's from, you know, documents and, and plant remains that have come out of trash pits and pottery and, you know, from inside, uh, again, usually trash pits. And that's what I, I tried to show you that picture because that was just a big, particularly big trash can. Um, it's, it wasn't a burial, it was a trash can. So, thank you. While we were at lunch, we had our own symposium of four people over pizza. And we were talking about these things, and I didn't get to make it the yesterday, but I was able to attend today. And I think one of the things, even within our conversation, that, you know, to me made a lot of sense is the fact that, you know, with the knowledge that you uh, have from your research and, you know, from the digs and all these different things that you have and the documentation, uh, I think uh, uh, we were talking and how that uh, until we really get to know who we are as a people, it's, it's going to be real difficult for us to bring that Native American perspective to any table. And so I'm just glad that this is going on. And I think you guys did a good job, David. I think what y'all's doing and the one that's going to be forthcoming, I hope it's, you know, in the same manner because, you know, again, I think it helps us acquaint ourselves with ourselves a lot better. The more that happens, then our perspective can really begin to be based upon something and, you know, and have be more foundational. And I think that's just all this is, and so I think that eventually will help us to uh, grow economically every way that we can. And so uh, uh, I'm just glad to be here, and, and I appreciate the, you guys sharing with us. Vet know and others know that we're interested. There are scholarships out there for Native people and Native students to do archaeological help with archaeological digs. I think the is it the SAA? You guys will know SAA that has the Native American scholarship. There's also a group that if they're looking just to do methodology, maybe not in the southeast, but down in Texas, there's a group that also I think is through Park Service that has an incredible um, scholarship too that covers everything. And then what those students do, or if you're or if you're like a, a tribal rep. You, you know, you can go down as well, and they'll, they'll um, assist you with different parts of the dig, whether it's in doing laboratory work, field work, just the different parts of it, and so you can go back each year to that one and do something a little bit different each time. So there are different things out there for, for students and for um, tribal members, too. I, in addition to that, too, I'd like to say, too, that Texas Anthropological Society also has a scholarship for Native Americans to come out and on one of their digs during the summer, and uh, the scholarship, you know, they'll they'll buy you a few tools, the basic tools, and you spend a week out in the field on excavation. They'll help you with a little gas money too. Yeah. 